Hello, hello, and welcome to Grad Chat by PhD Balance, where we talk about topics of grad school beyond academic research and that may be more difficult to talk about in our day to day. I'm your host, Linda, and I'm finishing up my master's in food science in Ireland. And for PhD Balance, I'm the Grad Chat lead and a Twitter coordinator. Don't forget to subscribe to Grad Chat on your chosen platform to get notifications about new episodes. And do leave us a rating or review if you feel like it. It helps people find the show and it gets the word out. Our topic today is getting diagnosed with chronic disease during grad school, and I'm excited to welcome our guest, Kasha. Kasha is a PhD student at the Institute of Science and Technology in Austria, studying developmental biology. Um, she holds a, a master's in molecular biotechnology and a bachelor's in biotechnology, both from the University of Warsaw in Poland. And uh, in her spare time, she is also the host and producer of the Science on Trial and Error podcast. Welcome, Kasia. Um, we're so pleased to have you on Grad Chat to discuss your experiences. Uh, how are you? Hi, Linda. I'm very grateful for the invitation. I'm, I'm okay. Um, it's the weekend, so, you know, um, I'm kind of in a relaxing mood and uh, I'm very happy that we can do this. That's great. Um, so welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to add to your introduction or are we good to dive right in? I think it's fine. It perfectly captures uh, my, my bio and yeah, thank you for mentioning the podcast <laughs> as well. <laughs> no problem. We love to self-promote here. Everyone should be self-promoting all the time. <laughs> So um, let's dive right in. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your experiences of being diagnosed with chronic disease during your PhD? Yes, um, this was definitely a challenging time for me. I mean, it has been actually because it just um, keeps going through ups and downs. Um, I was actually kind of already into my PhD when I started to feel very sick. And uh, at first, no one really knew what is happening, which I think was even worse than getting an actual diagnosis. So for quite a while, I was struggling to juggle work, which, as we all know, the PhD is so time consuming and so pressuring and so exhausting with going to the doctors and feeling really unwell and just not being able to tell anybody what is going on and not knowing myself. So this definitely was um, a difficult time. And it actually went on for almost a year before I managed to get um, a name for it. So before that, it was, you know, like it seemed um very stressful because you just want to know what it is and you also want to know it's not somehow invented or imaginary in your head and the whole process in combination with work and with not being able to maybe perform as you would like to um was definitely difficult after i got the diagnosis at least I I knew maybe better how to accommodate myself. I must say it's it was another difficulty to get used to new normality, to get used to new limitations. And I think the biggest challenge was to be just patient with myself and my body um, because I had to really change my expectations towards what I can do work-wise or what I can do um, life-wise and how to get this balance maybe a bit more into a healthy direction so yeah it's been um a bit more than three years since i got sick and yeah as you said it's chronic so it's gonna stay with me and yeah i think that kind of captures it what happened yeah so um i guess Going back to the, I, I, I resonate with this a lot myself because I'm also chronically ill. And um, that is something that I get a lot what you're saying with the waiting and not knowing what is going on. It's very, very difficult. Um, yeah. And um, it also is hard when, when you're with people around you because a lot of people are very accommodating for the first couple of weeks or a month 
but then you don't get better Agreed. and then they start questioning why yeah. aren't you getting better <laughs> yeah it's it's i mean even for my family who is still in poland you know they were hearing all about it over the phone or when we were chatting um but they weren't really seeing me because um I was just here and trying to work and going to the doctors and even to them it seemed kind of suspicious that you know you've been feeling so bad for a while why can't anybody tell you what is wrong like is it actually like that you're not that sick or what is the issue and one of the things that I guess you you know from your own personal experience is that when you get chronically ill you have to start being a bit more assertive to certain things that uh, you just have to start saying no to certain things. Yeah. And to me, this was extremely difficult because I was always a bit of a workaholic in a sense and just taking a lot of other additional stuff on me and always feeling like if I push strong enough, I can do everything. So I would cut sleep or I would not maybe eat properly um, and I could still manage, you know, like there were some hard days, but I would just push through it. But since I got sick, I cannot do it anymore, yeah. which ended up with me having to have to say no to, you know, like going somewhere or just not being able to maybe do so much physically after work because I was just so exhausted. Um, so, yeah, there was just this inability to tell anybody what's wrong feeling like your body is also not not fine so trying to find a way to to connect those two is very hard yeah definitely and it's sort of i know you mentioned this in your in your both sort of before finding the diagnosis and after getting the diagnosis but it's re reformatting the entire way you work really because like for me I used to do a lot of all-nighters to um get uh, things finished in it near a deadline and I can't do that it's it's not an option it's not going to happen so I had to completely restructure the way I work um yeah yeah I know that um to me it was more about um, I was working a lot on the weekends mm. and I would um, very often stay very long. You know, when I moved here, um, I was staying on campus and I was staying actually close by to the Institute, which was very convenient at the time. And also because I didn't know a lot of people, most of my friends are actually people from the Institute. So for me to go to work and then stay there for really really long time but in the meantime hanging out with my friends and doing some other stuff was kind of normal and then I would often come on the weekend and I wouldn't really feel bad about it I was just like at least I will finish my PhD faster or some other thing in my head mm, right now if I don't take time to rest I'm just really physically hurting and I had to learn how to listen to my body to know when to stop um and mentally it took a toll because i just felt like i'm failing on so many fronts like you know uh because i cannot as i said perform to some sort of expectation that i had in my head yeah so yeah it it took quite a lot of work to to accept this new normality as a normal kind of situation instead of uh limited version of the previous me mm. it is it's it's very much a a new normal and it's a new reconfiguration of what you can do so like for example one of my things is chronic fatigue and that is obviously a massive drain on my life and people don't really understand what that is they're like oh you're just tired and it's like yeah. no no it's not just being tired <laughs> it's 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 hard um and it feels very lonely at times because i have a lot of pain in my hands because my disease is related to the joints 
and I have to work a lot with my hands because I dissect in the lab, I pay pet, you know, all the biological work really relies on your hands. So at first I would just try to hide it in a way that I would just try to work as usual and not tell anything to anybody and just kind of hide the pain. Um, but at some point I really was reaching moments where I couldn't like bend my fingers anymore or you know it was very painful for me to also walk or I was just having these issues with the joints and people were like yeah you know but everybody has joints pain like you know it's cold outside and your hands hurt and yeah the same goes about the the fatigue it's just you really have to give your body time and you cannot push through this this is a different kind of um, exhaustion we're talking about I think it's very hard to understand it if you didn't experience it and the same goes for this new um, normal like it happened to me before COVID the disease and being diagnosed so I had to go through such a huge transition in my life and it was a lot of struggles and I was trying to explain to my friends and they weren't really getting it and then everybody had to go through the new normal during COVID and suddenly my friends were more like, we know now how it was that you suddenly couldn't do things that you wanted to do, how difficult it must have been. So I think it's just hard to understand if, you, if you're not going through such a process. And it takes a lot of patience and openness from other people to accommodate um, yeah, your health condition. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess speaking on accommodations, um, I don't know if this is a topic you want to go into, but is, did you find it easy to get accommodated even when you needed help? I, I don't think anyone finds it easy, but how was the process for you? <laughs> it's difficult. One thing that is difficult is admitting that you need accommodations to yourself and asking for help. I'm still struggling with it. Um, when it comes to work, as I said, I rely heavily on my hands. So um, it was a challenge. I think I, I'm lucky enough that at my institute, at least there is no uh, fixed hours. So I can be fairly flexible about when I come to work and, um, you know, like if I need to get more sleep or I cannot just in the morning manage to, to leave early, I don't have to worry about that. So this was already a big accommodation. Um, also at IST, um, we are part of the grad school and um, it was very good that when I told them about my condition, um, they were accommodating in a sense of extending some of my deadlines and um, kind of also extending my contract um, to accommodate for all the periods where I was on sick leave or I was in like recovering from something and um, just giving me the space to, you know, ask for certain things and then trying to be accommodating with that so this definitely um, has been great and i know that not everyone has as much luck you know sometimes uh it's not so easy to to get the extensions and to get um yeah to get people around you to to understand what you're going through but still the problem i think that I'm facing and probably you as well as a person who's sick with a chronic disorder is that people tend to forget that you're also sick even when you're there like of course they remember that you're sick when you're on sick leave and you're like physically not around but you're also sick when you're there it's not like your disease magically disappears of course it could be better maintained with the medication and it could be in uh, not in a flare-up but in a bit of a remission but still it's there and still you have to remember about it like you cannot push maybe as hard as a normal person or like not a sick person could do so i think this is a difficulty 
that I'm still sometimes struggling with. Absolutely. I think it's definitely something that is, that happens and that people just don't, even when they think they understand, they don't really, unless you're also sort of chronically ill or disabled or um, so uh, along the lines of that. Um, so I guess where, where did you find help? Where did you look for it? Did, did you look for it? <laughs> so yeah, I needed help. I mean, I needed help, first of all, with just getting the right treatment. And I'm sick with an autoimmune disorder. So it's been a challenge to even find the therapy and the doctor that would be it may sound weird, but the work that we do is not a usual work, right? I mean, grad school is exhausting and it's not like it's so easy to to just take breaks uh, every time you feel sick. And also it's not easy to maybe um, suffer for some of the side effects of the medication and just combine it with your work. So I definitely looked and it took a while to find a doctor that would understand what my work entails and to find a treatment that doesn't disturb my work and allows me to work and continue to to work kind of normally but i also needed mental support and i needed help with adjusting to the to the new situation i was in so i started um having therapy um at first it was quite uh, frequent just to figure out how to deal with the different stages of getting diagnosed and with different stages of just yeah adjusting to your chronic disease so this was something that you know at first i thought yeah i should probably go and see psychologist but i also didn't feel like what will i say like i'm just being ill and what can they do to to help with that but in the end this was i think extremely important because it allowed me to also see good parts that come from me being sick and it may sound weird but for example being sick made me realize that i need to be maybe more strict about my boundaries and to take care of things that are not work maybe with a bit more time and focus so yeah there are also the good things that came out from it and I only learned how to see them through the therapy yeah absolutely I think therapy is therapy is great for everyone um but I think when you're going through a diagnosis just having someone objective to talk with is vital if you can get access to it it really does help yeah and it's a lot of pressure the pressure from yourself the pressure from the peers maybe the pressure from you know like it's you are you want to finish the the graduate school you want to finish your phd and you just have to deal with all of this pressure so even when you're not sick just therapy helps a lot um and i think yeah i think this is something that really should be fixed in the in the whole system that the grad schools should have um just a mental aspect to it like a mental health mental help aspect to it as a usual thing it should be yeah. part of this experience absolutely yes and it's sort of one of the things that i i'm always a big advocate for 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 going to therapy i think everyone should be in it um but yeah and definitely if anyone is listening and you're like maybe should I go to therapy I'm not sure if you're thinking about it go to therapy <laughs> yeah definitely go to therapy I I think I'm glad that it's becoming less and less stigmatized and I'm glad that you know conversations like the PhD balance is starting um allows people to feel like 
you are not alone in this. Everybody does it and everybody needs it from time to time. And mm. it's completely normal. It's completely yes. normal to, to do it. And I would say to anyone listening that um, some universities do have free counseling. So you should check out your university to see if they have that available. And if they do not, you should also check if your university has a um, training center for psychologists because they will also do free or at least discounted sessions. So that is another way to access it. So um, that is just a bit of info for everyone listening. <laughs> yeah, but, definitely, uh, <laughs> definitely. Try to get the information and... Um, oftentimes there are occupational psychologists, at least, um, in the research institute. So, um, reach out and see if this, if this helps. Yes, definitely. But I suppose to get back to the conversation we're having, um, one of the things that I find a lot is that chronic illness, chronic disease, they don't, they're very against the academy they don't go with the ideals of what academia is about like the idea of you need to push yourself you just need to get through it you just need to keep going at all costs like you it's it's a you have to kind of refix your mindset i agreed 100 percent. i mean what you're mentioning is this toxic side of the academia right um that you have to perform and the performance matters the most. Um, there is this pressure about, you know, how much data you generate, how much time you spend. Like this is very toxic, and also the fact that somehow being sick makes you less of a researcher. To me, is 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 still a very hurtful thing. Um, that sometimes I, I hear, and you know. I've had people even suggesting to me um, as I think a good, like they thought it's a good advice saying like, you know, it seems like it's very hard. Why don't you just quit? Maybe it would be easier for you. Um, so it definitely takes um, a bit of a time to realize, do you want to still stay in academia? Because academia is not fully accommodating for people who are sick, chronically ill or disabled or, you know, underrepresented in general. It's just not an environment that is yet fully adjusted to, to accommodate it. Um, but I would say it's, it's really about you and figuring out why you're doing this. Why are you in grad school? And I mean, you don't have to stay in academia afterwards. For me, I don't know, honestly, if I would do a PhD if I got diagnosed before I started it, like being completely honest. I think probably I would try because I really love science and I really love what I do. But it makes me wonder, like, because I kind of knew that it's going to be a high pressure situation. So, of course, in these disorders, the stress just makes things worse. And then all becomes about balancing the stress to not make yourself feel worse. Mm. So, yeah, I think. I hope it's going to just improve and, you know, it's going to be more accommodating. But for now, what I'm trying to do is find a way for me to navigate through this uh, without making myself sicker and to to wrap up my PhD, hopefully in the next year. And then I will see if if academia is actually what I want to do, because even the grant, you know, institutions, they only look at how long it takes you to achieve certain things. They look at the numbers. Of course, they will ask you why you had breaks or something or like academic leaves, but it's still um, not accommodating definitely this kind of situations, the situations that um, are like this. But I think 
there is a bit of a movement and I'm very hopeful that we will see more accommodating academia in the future. Absolutely. I there is there is some movement, a small, very small, but it's yeah. it's moving. <laughs> it's moving because we talk about it. So yeah. it's important to also if you feel comfortable enough to to share these experiences because this then can help maybe fix some some of the errors of the system. Absolutely. And I think one thing that um, I guess comes to mind from what we've been talking about is I know you said that there's very flex, there's a lot of flexibility in in your hours um, and when you work. But um, is that very good for like all the doctor's appointments that you have and stuff like that? Is Do you still find that difficult? Mm, it takes a bit of uh, juggling. So I have to do for example physiotherapy for some of the things that uh, happen to my joints and when i have to do it very regularly then it's quite stressful to um to manage i i live in vienna but my workplace is around one hour away so if i have to go to a doctor and then i still have to get to work and then i have to work a full day and then come back my days become very stretched. So it's definitely sometimes it's it's quite tough. So I try not to have too many doctors in one week. So I don't have to every day go between the two places so much. And I mean, I'm very lucky that Austria has a very good healthcare system. So, you know, it's not so difficult to get appointments and it's a bit easier maybe to shift them because you don't have to wait so long. Mm. But yeah, it is sometimes challenging, especially with experimental work to fit everything, to be able to do. Sometimes the experiments take several hours and you just cannot be in two places at the same time. But yeah, I try to. I became much better at organizing my time, at planning. Uh, like, you know, all the planners have become my um companion and i just i really have to be careful about these things like i really have to check myself am i having too many hours running around because then i will run out of energy and run out of power so yeah i have to be much better at time management absolutely i think time management planning and advocating for yourself are probably the best skills in a chronically ill, chronically chronic disease, someone who has chronic disease um, person toolkit. <laughs> yeah, I think the advocating part is still difficult for me because I struggle a lot with guilt still, guilt of being the sick person and guilt of maybe not being the old me and um sometimes i feel guilty about not working enough and sometimes i feel guilty about not having enough time or energy to to meet with all of my friends and like be as active as i was so the guilt is still a problem mm. but i would say um yeah therapy helps and learning how to um speak up and and you know it's also about honesty at first I was I was scared to say I can't do this because I'm sick. Um but it's just the best way. Rather to make up excuses and to to maybe because then you just maybe people will understand it easier if you say it a bit more honestly. So to me honesty has been the best solution to this, to the guilt, to just really say honestly, I can't do this and the guilt is not going to change that. Yeah, but it's a struggle. It's definitely a struggle. Without a doubt, it is a struggle, and it's it's also very sometimes can feel a bit isolating because you can't go out with your friends as much. You can't meet up as much. You can't. It also sometimes feels like someday that they might stop asking <laughs> because oh, you yeah. say no so much. Yeah. Yeah, I, I fear that I am very lucky to have 
very um, understanding friends. But I think it's mostly my fear and it's mostly in my head that at some point I will just no longer be invited because I all the time say no because I cannot do this. And also I think it's, you know, you start taking up hobbies that are more home-based. Mm. Uh, so, you know, I, I usually write, liked reading books, but um, now I started to draw and, you know, I started doing the podcast because this I can do even when I feel really sick. I can just do it at home and it's something different than working and it's something different than just being alone and it allows me to meet people and to talk to them, you know, even when I'm sick at home. So, yeah, you you learn this, but it is quite alienating and yeah, yeah I, I sometimes struggle with this because on one hand I would like to see people, but on the other hand, I don't feel like I can be a very entertaining company when I'm in pain. So, yeah. Yeah, it's no, I, it, it is. And I, I still, I know a lot of people are going away from Zoom and they say that, oh, Zoom is, Zoom is um, terrible, that they hated it. But I love Zoom. I still meet <laughs> up with my friends on Zoom um, regularly. And it's sort of like, they have seen me in every sort of way. They've seen me lying in bed in a Zoom call, in my yeah. pajamas all sort of whatever they just know Linda turns up she's wrapped in a blanket she's not having a great day <laughs> but at, at least yeah exactly it's it allows you to be more included mm. and this is great like this is one of the things that I also really appreciated that that you can just be connected with people more because previously you would probably just be I don't want to say it like this but you'd be a bit left behind um because you cannot go in person somewhere but now yeah when you can connect via zoom it's i also love zoom like honestly i really love it yeah. and i wish we would not drop it entirely now that we can move around more freely i know absolutely it's it's still very it's still connecting people it's still amazing and it's you know, I also have friends across time zones that I would never have met if I haven't, if I didn't have Twitter and Zoom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I see your point. Sorry, that was a tangent, but um, I guess, <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> I guess to talk a bit about um, you and your journey, what, did you have a conversation with your PhD supervisor after you got diagnosed? Yes. Yes, I did. I mean, I we've had several conversations. It was definitely a process. Um, because at first, I didn't even know what is wrong. So it was very weird because I had to be like, at a doctor a lot. And suddenly I was like, so tired. I was just feeling like I, I cannot make it through the whole day of work. Um, so it was difficult to to find a way because at first, you know, when it's short, it's fine. Like everybody is like, OK, you're having a rough few weeks. But then it was going on and going on and no one could tell me what it is. And I couldn't tell what it is, but I still needed a different working arrangement. So it was several conversations and um, I think now it's it's just more clear. So it's easier because when we both know what is happening, it's easier. Um, yeah, let's let's leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's grand. Um, yeah, no, I do think that is definitely one of the big problems with the way that that the most workplaces um, accommodate disabilities and chronic illnesses is that they assume that you will just automatically get a diagnosis mm -hmm. and that does it doesn't happen like it can take a year it can take six months it can take several years to get a diagnosis and yeah. until you have that diagnosis they're very reluctant to accommodate you I agree and in general many workplaces 
as I said, you have to keep, uh, I don't want to say reminding people, but sometimes you have to be very upfront that you're still sick, even when you're not on sick leave. It's just, it's not like you can make it go away. It's just going to be there always. And of course, it's, it's a problem for your supervisor. It's a problem for your project, but it's also a problem for you. And um, yeah, I think uh, for me, it was, it was hard because when you don't know what it is, people tend to think that maybe it's nothing that serious if it doesn't have a name. So I don't know if this was also your experience, but yeah, this yes, no, definitely, definitely hurts. Yeah. yeah. And it's also very much, uh, some people are like, oh, is she lying about it? She's just lying to get to get an easier job, to, to not do all the responsibilities. Special treatment yeah. Uh, comments. Yeah, yeah, I, I know this. Um, yeah, it's hard. I mean, it's just, as I said, if someone is not going through this, they will not understand it fully. And um, they will be like, well, your hands hurt too bad like you it doesn't seem like they look very different mm -hmm. you look a bit more pale but i mean we all have days when we didn't sleep so well like it's easy to to assume that it's not as serious as it really is especially i mean we're not gonna wear a tag on our heads or we're not gonna you know like i got a comment once that i don't look so sick because I, let's say, put makeup. And I mean, what the fact that I'm sick means that I shouldn't look nice or like I cannot look nice uh, anymore. And I found it, it like I found it very hurtful at first. And then I was like, yeah, I mean, it's easier for people to assume that if you look sick, you are very sick. But yeah it's not a rule whatever works to make you feel better mentally should be fine with everybody else yeah like you if you like makeup wear makeup that's 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 the thing <laughs> you mm -hmm. you do it you don't you don't um makeup is very much a thing for you so if you want to wear it you wear it but that goes for anything it's very much a like one thing that I miss that I can't do anymore is I can't do high heels anymore and I used to love heeled boots me too mm -hmm. <laughs> and I really miss them sometimes um I still have a few pairs I don't wear them but I just look at them in the wardrobe sometimes <laughs> I also have some like I have moments when I feel very good, especially in the summer when I'm like, mm, should I try them on? But then it it doesn't work anymore like this. Like it just causes too much pain. So I completely agree. Um, but I also stopped the other way around. I stopped putting makeup just to make people feel comfortable. So, you know, I have days when I don't feel like putting makeup at all. And before I was sick, I would still probably do it just to not look bad or whatever. Now I don't do it anymore. I just do whatever feels right for me on a day. And I try not to pay so much attention as to whether someone then feels that I look sick and I remind them of being sick. Like, yeah, but it's again a, a bit of a mindset change that needs to happen, yeah. I guess it's it's a process it, I think it, it comes with time and it comes in phases like you slowly start to accept it and you slowly start to care less about what other people who have nothing to do with you think um yeah and I think it's also important to mention that you don't owe anyone anything you don't owe anyone any explanations and in most countries you have legal protections over not telling people yeah yeah this is something that i oftentimes think about now now that i'm clo coming closer to the defense like when i look for the next job should i talk about it or not i know that i'm legally protected in most countries so i don't have to say it and i know that in science there's a lot of people in academia that they will just um 
maybe not want you then they will assume certain things that you will not perform and you know on the other hand do you want to work for someone who will be like this because it's not like your disease is going to disappear so this is something that i'm still not sure about and i'm still kind of trying to figure out how to process this and how to approach this i mean it's but yeah it's a personal preference some people do tell people some people don't tell some people will not disclose until after they get offered a job some people mm -hmm. will disclose for interviews some people won't disclose at all that it is very much a personal preference and that is up to you I disclose because I do not want to work with someone who is going yeah. to be ableist towards me who is not going to give me accommodations who's going to be telling me that I can't take time off for doctor's appointments that sort of thing yeah um I don't I don't want to but that comes with its own privilege as well um in of that course. um I am able to support myself if I get a hundred job rejections for saying that <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing. I I mean, I agree that it's very personal. It's just to me, for a really long time, it seemed like I really shouldn't do it. I just felt like the environment is very negative towards it. And um, people start thinking about you in different terms, um, which really shouldn't happen. Like, my work speaks for itself. Why does it matter? In, I mean, in some sense, the, the disease affects the work a bit. As you said, you have to go to the doctors and stuff like this. But I'm slowly going towards the this conviction that I also would like to work with someone who will not, who will accommodate my, my condition. Or at least, you know, will not treat it as a fake thing or as I'm lying or something like this because yeah. this also happens yeah it's it's very much like i i've seen a lot of different reactions i've seen we will just completely ignore the condition completely and you will get treated the same as everyone else um i now think you are completely incapable of everything um you are a terrible person you should not be in a job people who are ill and sick can't do it um, and I've seen people, unfortunately, in the minority who are completely accommodating or who will try their best to accommodate you. Um, so I've seen a lot of different things. Um, hopefully we will be moving more towards the accommodating thing. But um, unfortunately, it is in the minority in my experience. I agree. I oftentimes feel like I have to be the one to accommodate someone that like in a way that I can still do everything as I'm supposed to do even though I'm sick like I have to prove myself in a sense if this makes sense to you yeah like yeah it's it's more about me trying to find a way to make everything work yeah. rather than receiving so much help I like so much yeah and, and easy working conditions yeah it's also like um, I have to prove that I'm worth also the extra money that it takes to accommodate me. So some of my accommodations cost money. And um, sometimes for a long time, I had the mindset of if I use these, I have to work 10 times as hard to make sure that I deserve these. And that obviously doesn't work. No, but yeah, I think the feeling is very common. Like, I also feel like I have to prove that I'm working as hard as everybody else, even though I I do. It's just somehow, yeah. I don't know if this is more, like, it's partially external and it's partially internal, I guess, that you feel the need to make sure that everybody thinks that you are the same. And then on the other hand, some people really will assume that you get a special treatment and you didn't have to work as hard and yeah it's yeah. and as you said it's a minority when it comes to people that really know how to accommodate this kind of situations 
Yes, and one thing that I like to say is that accommodations are not special treatment. They are trying to bridge the gap between where you are and where I am. And most of the time they don't even get there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I agree, I agree. Um, definitely. As I said, you have to oftentimes make also accommodations from your side. So it's really not one person just doing all the effort to, to accommodate, which is Absolutely. oftentimes forgotten, yeah. And I guess um, we've been talking for ages, but um, sorry, no, no, this has been a great conversation. I love, I love talking about all this, but um, is there any other topics that you would like to bring in before we finish? Um, well, I already mentioned it briefly, but the mental health being, I think is important to me. I, what I like to say is that everybody around you has very similar problems and the the pressure to to perform can be very blinding in some sense um so you may oftentimes feel like you're alone um but there are, first of all there are people around you that go through the same thing like we really go almost all of us through the same things and sometimes it's it just needs you need a moment to connect and you will actually find someone else who's going for the same thing but another thing is that really if you if you feel like you're struggling and you cannot find your path and things are just hard try to get into therapy try to get some some help it it sometimes is enough to just talk even once and it helps a lot just have someone to listen so yeah i really think we should normalize and make it less stigmatized uh, the mental health well-being and also taking care of your well-being through having a work-life balance which is a bit of a unicorn in some sense like the healthy one but at least going towards this and trying to find time for you and not feeling bad when you make time for you. It's already something towards it. Yeah. So try to do that. Absolutely. You are the most important. So put you first always. And um, I guess the last question from me is tell us about your podcast so that we can hear a bit about it. <laughs> okay. Mm, so you mentioned the name signs on trial and error. The idea was was actually born a while back, but only during COVID I figured I have enough time to start this. Um, I really wanted to talk to people about their their stories. Like I know we talk a lot about our work and we talk a lot about our research and we are kind of perceived through our resume when it comes to academia, but we all have very unique stories and in order to do this kind of work, we all have a lot for science inside us, which was born sometime when we were usually very small. So I like asking people about this and I thought it would be a good start for a podcast. What is a very cool thing that came out of it is that um, people get very honest, which I'm very grateful for, and they share not only the good stuff, but also the bad stuff and how they dealt with them and how they approach them. And I appreciate this because it helps to create a sense of community and it helps to uh, create a sort of safe space to to feel like you're not alone in certain experiences. And also, I like to think about it in a sense of making academia more aware, because I always ask my guests, what is the one thing that they would try to fix if they could? And the answers are just so different. And everybody has a thing that is close to their heart that they would like to change. And I think if we speak about it more and raise the awareness, that's the good way to, to move things even a little bit. So yeah, that's the science on trial and error. It's about trying and making errors and then still loving science in the end and yeah the personal stories 
Awesome. And we will put all of your information for the podcast in the description of this episode. And um, thank you. I guess the very, very last question is <laughs> where can people get in touch with you? You can get in touch with me uh, through my Twitter. Um, and uh, you can also get in touch with me through the podcast channel. So we are available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and also on YouTube, just as a sound, but you can also listen to us there. And you can also get in touch uh, through email. Um, and yeah, I think that's the easiest. I mean, Instagram, of course, uh, it's it's a very huge medium as well. Um, I'm not TikToking. I somehow find a, myself to be quite resistant still. Uh, but who knows? Who knows? Who has, who has time for TikTok? I, I don't have time. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Agreed. So Twitter, Instagram, or other podcast channels. Feel free to get in touch. Awesome. This has been really, really great. So um, this has been Grad Chat by PhD Balance. Our episodes are now posted simultaneously on our podcast and YouTube channel every second Saturday. You can connect with PhD Balance on our website at phdbalance.com or over on Twitter and Instagram at phd underscore balance. Until next time, goodbye and take care of yourself.